I got interested 10 years ago at the Alameda County Fair because they had acquired some old printing equipment, old linotype machine, an old Ludlow machine, and a couple of hand platen, uh, hand operated presses. And so I volunteered to go over there and lock up the type and print bookmarks for them as an idea of how printing was done in the early days of the century. I've always had an interest in uh, history, and especially local history. So I started collecting facts about Livermore over the years, putting them on three by five note cards. And finally I decided, well, I might as well put them out into a book because I enjoy printing, so why not print my own book? And we named it after the famous light bulb in Livermore with a takeoff on that saying by, will the last leaving Livermore please unscrew the bulb in fire station one? I have a certain way I hold the camera, <clears throat> a certain way I shoot things, a certain way I light, light things, and I'm making a consistent statement. And I don't do fat people, and I don't do things that demean people or uh, showing them in their underwear with a crack on their butt showing. I'm not going to do that. That's not what it's about. I'm interested in that mainstream experience, and that mainstream experience is the 10-year-old having a birthday party at the pizza parlor. You want to go photograph something, go photograph that one, man. The Livermore Pole represents the 100-year history of the city of Livermore, starting with the founder, Robert Livermore, back in the 1880s. Um, and he is sitting uppermost on the totem pole on the lap of the eagle. The next figure represents agriculture, the farmer. When Livermore was founded, it was an agricultural community. The third figure below that is represents industry by the beaver. And there he is holding a plaque depicting atomic energy. When I did the history book on early days of the Amador Livermore Valley, I found that many people didn't have photographs. And then I began to see the, the need for paintings, because this tells you the story of a farm. I wonder sometimes if you were hypnotized, could you go back in your brain and hear uh, uh, some of the stories that my grandmother told me now about when she was a little girl and uh, the terrible uh, floods and, and droughts that they had at that time. That giant cowboy, I don't know how, how tall he is, but Edward decided that if he got a picture of it, he wanted, he wanted to know exactly how large it was. So I would go and stand, I guess, between his legs. I went through a ditch, up a bank, over a fence, and through a rutted field to get there. And I don't think anybody sees me standing there. It's such a huge, we got lo lost in the background. I don't think we intended to become seashell collectors. Before you know it, you have uh, way over a thousand seashells, which is what we do have. When Edward was flying across the Pacific and he would very often have a layover on Wake, I Wake Island. And he started to snorkel for seashells.
We devised a way to get those clean before he brought them home. We got a, a canned heat stove that he kept on wake, and he'd put the seashells in a pan and boil them just a little bit and bury them in the sand, and the ants ate those seashells clean, especially if they were boiled. They obviously like cooked meat. This is the deep. Glory of the deep. If we could just find it, which one it is now. That's this one right here. That's the glory, yeah. This is, is a, a very, very valuable shell. They call it the glory of the deep. Uh, we have a, a great big one of these, and it would be worth something that has a little chip in it. These are the two smaller ones. I have a bigger one somewhere else. We came to Livermore thinking that we would stay only until we decided where we were going to go to retire. And retirement had come very suddenly because Edward had a heart attack on Wake Island on his way home from the Philippines. And that ended his career as a commercial airline pilot. We just came on a temporary basis and it turned out to be a permanent thing because we both liked the valley and the little city of Livermore. We found, found that it was just exactly what we were looking for. The sun is almost setting on the rolling hills of gold. The earth is calling vespers and the gentle breeze unfolds. The meadow One hundred years of Livermore history has passed. This is a documentary film of the centennial year, of the people, activities, and events that were Livermore, 1969. We're just calling it a centennial movie, and uh, but, no, you had a name that was that was awful. Anyway, I I decided the only thing I could come up with was a century has passed, and um, it turned out to be 55 minutes long, color and sound, and everything that happened that year in connection with the centennial is in there. The Pfeiffers were the official photographers for the Centennial. Uh, and they made this really nice movie. And I think probably all of us who were on the committee in one way or another were in the movie somewhere. I haven't seen it for 29 years, something like that. So I said, well, I've got some 16 millimeter movie equipment. I'll, uh, I'll do it if you furnish the film and the processing. And I do the editing and splicing and all the other work that goes with it. The Centennial movie is a very good picture of what happened in Livermore in 1969. Because every event that they had, we were there. There was just one event after another. There was no stopping. It, 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 it was much more than, than he expected it to be and much more than either of us wanted it to be, but we just had to go to many things over and over again.
I just checked, and in 1967, when we came here, the population was about 31,000. It is 73,000 today. And that shows in almost everything. Just for example, when we drive into town from North Livermore, from our house in North Livermore, we used to drive down First Street, and we would see cattle grazing just off the road in the pasture, and we'd see hills in the distance. Today, of course, the cattle are all gone, but the roofs of all these new houses are hills. A, uh, a totem pole on Centennial Park in a very prominent location. This might appear to be somewhat unusual since the Indians in the native Indians in this area didn't have totem poles. But we had a person who was running for the state legislature, and Livermore was in his area. And his name was Adam Nord Nordwall. Uh, Adam Nordwall. I think he was from Hayward. I'm not sure. Uh, I was at his house once or twice, but it's been so long ago, I forget exactly where. And he carved this uh, in uh, the area where Betty Ann was. Uh, what was that area called? Railroad Avenue. Railroad, New yeah, Railroad Avenue. There's a new shopping center was going up in Livermore, California, and they wanted a totem pole to grace their parking lot and I was commissioned to do a totem pole, an 18-foot pole, carved out, to be carved out of redwood uh, for the sum of $2,000, which was a very modest sum. And then they stiffed me. They didn't pay up. They said, well, the, the rentals are not coming in as we had hoped, or the, the money's not coming, etc." And so um, I never really officially turned the poll. And because it was a commission poll that acknowledged a 100-year history of the city of Livermore, they're uh, sitting on the eagle's lap. On the very top of this poll is Robert Livermore, the founding father of the city of Livermore. A special poll like that, I can't go and sell on the open market. It's a commission poll. I decided this would be a great public relations thing on my behalf, is to give the poll to the people, the people of Livermore, the good people. So I gave them the poll, and then I, I thought that was the end of it. And later on, a few months went by, and the owners of the shopping center called me and said that they have a totem pole down here and they'd like to get rid of it. And uh, in a moment of weakness, I said, well, yes, uh, I'll have our crews pick it up. When it was finished, it sat here for quite a while before they decided where they were going to put it. So they put it in a little park and called it Centennial Park. And uh, 
the city, when they uh, went to erect it, decided it was too tall. Well, I thought it was a little out of scale, maybe with the park, and so we had it cut off at the bottom. So I go out, uh, the next time I'm in the city of Livermore, I go to Centennial Park, anticipating the full height and glory of the totem pole, 18 feet tall plus the base. What I got there stunned and shocked me. I saw a stunted pole. The whole bottom had been either cut off, six feet of it had been cut off, four feet of it had been put in concrete, and so it was just a stubby little pole. Adam Nordwell took one look at what had been done, and he says, okay, you give me my total pole back. Dear Mayor, it was almost two years ago a totem pole depicting the 100-year history of the city of Livermore was offered to a community that appeared proud of its longevity, achievements, and growth. One of the conditions to be met by the city in receiving the gift was that no defacing or alteration of the pole was to be allowed. This condition has been violated by the burial of one-third of its height in concrete. If the city of Livermore cannot or will not properly erect the totem pole by March 8th, I must regretfully inform you of my intentions to reclaim the totem pole. Sincerely, Adam Nordwall, Chairman, United Bay Area Council of American Indian Affairs. He said, well, if they don't put that totem pole up, uh, then I'll just take it away. And, uh, and so I... I believe my response was to the reporter, well, that would be fine, he can have it, you know, it's not really uh, uh, representative of the indigenous people here in the valley. Out of just pure frustration, I said, well, if you can't do anything about the totem pole, I am going to put a curse on the city's sewer system. And with nervous laughs coming from the council members, I just walked out of the meeting. That was it. I was upset. But I left behind the curse on the city's sewer system. He told the reporter that if they didn't do that, he would uh, bring a curse on the city and cause the sewers to back up. And they had pulled a manhole cover off, and she went, out of curiosity, she went to the work crew and said, what's going on out here? And the workmen told her, the sewers are backing up. Oh my God, she turned around, she went running back into the house to her councilman husband. She says, you gotta get a hold of the Indians, the sewers are backing up in the city. They started apologizing and others were saying, hey, you know, uh, we found a contractor who voluntarily bring that pole out of the concrete. No charge, he volunteers. So we got that. We're gonna put this on a nice concrete base. We found the base, by the way, it's in the corporate yard. That six foot we cut off, we found that. We're gonna put that back together. We'll put a steel uh, beam behind it to reinforce it. And we're gonna put it on a nice concrete base. They even drawn sketches of that and we're going to put a bronze plaque. I chose for this little history trivia book is will the last person leaving Livermore please unscrew the bulb in fire station one in my preface I say for the uninitiated Livermore has long held the title in the Guinness Book of World Records for having the longest burning light bulb in America glowing continuously in the firehouse since 1901 
I would get on the tailboard of the engine and we'd be, the siren would be sounding and the red lights would be flashing and we'd head out of the fire, you know, the barn. And uh, I would usually, if I could, give the light bulb a little tap and watch it swing. I had no idea that I was tapping one of a kind in all the country that was the longest burning light bulb in the world. We had people coming every day to look at the light bulb. It was a uh, historic point of interest and in people come here and they do today as well. They come from all over the world today. Yet not every firefighter knows everything about it. We've been trying to make that as one of the academy uh, test questions so that they do know something a little bit about the history. Uh, we've got people like I've said, who have come from all different states in the United States, all different countries uh, throughout the world, uh, Japan, China, Australia, Europe, uh, European countries, you know, France, Germany, Spain, uh, China. Uh, we've got that pretty well documented and, and we have filled up several of these guest books and, and we're glad that people come in and that they say yeah I'll sign my name as a guest there I've seen the light bulb and here's my proof when you think about it that light bulb represents stability in a world in a country and in a nation when there are so many things that are unstable uh, that light bulb has been very, very stable. And I think people come and look at that and maybe reflect on, gee, if, if life could be just as stable as that light bulb. So I do really believe that there's a lot, a lot of uh, maybe personal uh, reflection when people come and look at that light bulb. It's not just the light bulb that they're looking at. Maybe they're reflecting on better times, times past, you know, relatives who were alive at one time when that light bulb was burning and who are now gone. The, the big event today is the 100th anniversary of the Livermore light bulb in Fire Station 1, originally now Fire Station 6. Well, to commemorate the uh, 100th anniversary of the light bulb, we had a crowd of 600 people turn out tonight. Believe it or not, we actually sang happy birthday to a light bulb. I'm sure the light bulb didn't hear us, but it, we had a big kick out of that, and the crowd did it with gusto. from President Bush and his wife Laura commending the city on the celebration and the long-lived bulb. And we've devised a website for it and we have a www.centennialbulb.org website we're going to leave up all year with a live webcam which is focused on the bulb 24 hours a day watching over it and also letting people around the world see what the bulb looks like. In 1968, my first job was at the Livermore Independent. And when you work for a small town newspaper, or any newspaper for that matter, you have total accessibility and credibility. So I could go to the country club, where there'd be the junior women's club meeting, and there'd be 300 women at luncheon, and five women setting up on the stage, and I can walk up in front of everybody, hold up my camera and take a photograph, and walk away and nobody thinks a thing about it. The book Suburbia was written by Bill Owens. He was staff photographer for the Weekly Independent in Livermore for many years. And he collected these pictures over the years while he was on assignment for the Independent. Uh, and the first book he wrote was Suburbia, showing about lifestyles in the Livermore Valley and the other parts of the Bay Area during the uh, late 60s and early 70s. And the best thing I did is I ran ads in the, in the Independent newspaper saying, uh, working on a documentary photographer in Livermore, California. Please call me so I can come and photograph your house, your kids, your car, whatever. And so when people would call me up, they, they just welcome you into your house and you walk in and fo photograph whatever you want to photograph. You know, you open up the book and there's a photograph of the knife and forks and <clears throat> spoons and all the other kind of stuff and the uh, shot. I mean, those are people who are not uptight, and so I can go make those shots, and they're not, oh, oh my God, he photographed our knife and fork drawer. I mean, they just, 
What the hell are you doing that? I think it's just interesting how neat and orderly you are. I'm very proud of how neat and orderly I am. Bill came in the barber shop and said he wanted a picture of a pregnant lady. And uh, then my boss at the time, Norm Volpone, said, well, let's go over to Pat's house. His wife's pregnant, overdue, ready to have the baby. I mean, you've got to photograph uh, the things that are most obvious. And I think that's the big shock in suburbia photographers is I went out and photographed the most obvious thing in the world is people barbecuing. And nobody ever thought to photograph barbecuing. I'd say we sort of kind of faked the picture. We took uh, barbecued meat out of the refrigerator, put it on the grill out in the backyard. For some reason, that picture, uh, amongst all the intellectuals back east, that picture was used at the Smithsonian, that picture was used everywhere. Nothing was ever said in the book as to her condition at the time. Yet the critics and everyone else who uh, uh, talked about the leadoff picture, about the, uh, the overweight people, California, patios, barbecue, the whole West Coast thing, everybody kind of forgot the woman was getting ready to have a baby at any second. People here were upset that it showed up close and made them look rather foolish and that suburbia was not the kind of lifestyle that uh, was, was considered to be, uh, um, uh, I would say, a, uh, favorable to, to a way to live. Uh, the only time there was a reaction from the book that was negative is a shot in a book of, and it's one of my favorite shots, of a wall with a stereo and family portraits and all the books are there. I'm okay, you're okay, California the Beautiful, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, Time Magazine, uh, etc. It's all right there. And the people were very, very upset with me because you could see the little wire coming down off the wall from the stereo instead of having the wire tucked underneath. So they felt that it was not, they, they didn't like that. The shot of the wigs, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, I get my hair done, is much more sardonic or whatever. Uh, the lady loved it. You don't know what other people are thinking. You can't uh, say, oh, they're going to be very upset. Some people are very proud to, to show off things that you think are totally stupid. And the, so what? I mean, that's somebody's opinion. Um, I'm just not going to worry about that. That's only one shot out of a hundred. You're trying to tell a whole story, to gather a whole feeling, and to get the texture of the community. And I think that's what it's about, is the texture of our lives. And that's why, I, again, like I said, I hate Norm Norman Rockwell gave us images of the American dream that just simply aren't true. I made a very nice little slice. It's my slice of how I saw it. I'm only one individual. and how I editorialized it. He just wanted to show it the way it was and uh, how it would look to the outside world. And I think that his uh, success uh, shows that it was well received and that people found that a fascinating uh, uh, snapshot of life in the uh, early 70s in, in sprawling, the suburban sprawl of Northern California. After the book came out, I think a year later, I got a Guggenheim uh, I don't think anybody in Livermore's ever gotten to Guggenheim before. I got, I think, two letters saying congratulations. Uh, my books, photographs were bought by the Museum of Modern Art. Uh, I had shows all over the country, shows that traveled for a couple of years, shows in Europe. And there was a lot of applause for that. But you got to remember, I'm just one of, on a person on a staff at the local newspaper, and people really don't care. I mean, their lives really are busy. I'm just another person, and a photograph of them Pulling weeds on a weekend in their yard doesn't mean anything. Them mowing their lawn doesn't mean anything. 
I attempted to do a fourth book on <clears throat> leisure, and I couldn't get it together. I could not get a grant, and I had a couple of NEAs. Uh, my wife eventually left, moved to Tahoe. Uh, I got two kids. I'm living in the suburbs. I have no money, no job, did substitute teaching. And finally, one day, I found the camera underneath the seat of the car, and I decided I was no longer a photographer. I just did whatever I could, substitute teaching, whatever I could to make a living. My photographs begin to appear in sociology textbooks all over the country, that's for sure. And, you know, you make $100 here and $150 there, but you don't make any money. <clears throat> I think had I discovered a widget and made $100 million and built a house up on the top of the President Ridge, people would have made paid attention. Rodeo started in 1918 and it's been an integral part of Livermore's history ever since because this was a big cow town. Uh, it was a large uh, community of cowboys and ranches and uh, farms around Livermore uh, since its founding. This is my favorite painting by a local artist, and my wife uh, bought it for me for Father's Day one year. Uh, this is Tilly Calhoun's painting. She does a lot of community paintings based on things that she's seen in Livermore. Uh, this particular painting was of a rodeo parade, and I've been involved in rodeo parades for 20 years now. Uh, this parade had uh, special significance because she used a couple of snapshots that were taken when I was parade chairman in 1980, and it shows me in the foreground in a white cowboy hat and white shirt. The Rodeo started in 1918, and my father went to that Rodeo, and I think went to every one after that. He was a great Rodeo fan until he died at 86. The last time he went, he was uh, 86. My uh, father grew up on the home farm, which is also where I grew up. Here we see the house being built, and uh, one, one um, night when we were having our sing-along, we were singing Shine on Harvest Moon, and this I won't forget because as we were singing it, the, the moon popped up over the hills over there, so that was really fun to, to watch and, and a nice memory to have. As a little girl, I used to just love to uh, go along and, and push the... Was this the one? Maybe this was the other one over there. So that along this, and as a little girl, I can remember loving to do that. That was kind of like a magic thing if you pushed it. And uh, we didn't have all the mechanical things you have now. Uh, but had green tile with a fleur-de-lis pattern on it, right side up, fleur-de-lis pattern. And uh, so when I come out here, there's so many things that remind you of growing up in an old Victorian. The Livermore that I grew up in was the Livermore where you would see the, uh, the farm stretching from the Altamont, over the Altamont, down up over the, the hills. Here's the uh, walnut orchard, and uh, here, uh, this is the big walnut trees, and some of these are still here. The deodore trees are still out there. 
uh, today. Um, Highway 84 is going through this hay field, and Murdell Lane goes through this hay field. The uh, Villa of the Palms uh, apartments are, are in that area now. The, the biggest change since the 70s when I first remembered Livermore in the late 60s has been growth. And I'm talking about sprawl. And a lot of the vineyards have been taken over by housing developments. Traffic is blocked up out on the Altamont, back to Greenville Road, and, you know, clear into Tracy sometimes. A while back, Livermore and uh, the Santa Clara Valley were called the small capitals of Northern California. Hopefully, uh, we just won't cover every inch of all of this good farmland uh, what will we do eventually for uh, raising food and all? Lawrence uh, Livermore National Laboratory, located in Livermore, is one of the principal research facilities in the United States, and especially when it comes to nuclear weapons. Well, the lab started out here as an alternative nuclear weapons design laboratory to build the hydrogen bomb because they were moving too slowly in Los Alamos. That's a big political story. Dr. Teller had worked on the Manhattan Project at Los Alamos, uh, along with uh, Dr. Oppenheimer. Dr. Oppenheimer, however, was one of the scientists that felt that we shouldn't move ahead on a thermonuclear uh, divide uh, for his own reasons. The Atomic Energy Commission felt that we should and established the, the laboratory here in Livermore on the Wagner Field. The lab came in 1952. When it came, it started hiring people, and the city grew fairly rapidly. When we got here in 1956, now the city was 12,000. It's 2,000 now. As the lab people came and became a larger fraction of the community, uh, there was the obvious split between the old residents and the new residents. Most of us thought, oh, the lab isn't going to last very long, and uh, uh, they proved us wrong on that. Well, some people were afraid that it would blow up. I mean, it was the atomic lab, it was called, at, at uh, the, the atom research plant or so on. So naturally, some people were afraid that this great explosion could come. In, in some ways, Livermore's a company town. 
know, the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory in Sandia. You know, a lot of the folks that work there live here. 60% of the people that live there, uh, that work there, live in this valley. My twin brother worked out there. My other brother worked out there. Uh, my daughter and her husband works out there. Some of them uh, um, are in classified work. A lot of people who work at the laboratory, you know, wrestled with this issue. Should we be doing this kind of work? Are there, every so often there's something in there. That's why so many people have melanoma and cancers out here. And so every so often there's another rumor that the, uh, the water's all contaminated. You don't want to deploy a lot of nuclear weapons. You don't want to build a lot of nuclear weapons, but you need to know how to do this and how to be at the forefront of nuclear weapons. Because if you aren't, the Russians or the Albanians or the Pakistanis or at this point, the Iraqis and the Iranians uh, are serious, can be become a very serious menace. When I was a little kid, we had earthquake drills and we had bomb drills. And I knew that Russia was my enemy. And so for me to be going into Russia was very, very scary, especially a city that was not on the map. Um, you know, a, a city where I was told I would have no communication with my family. My mother cried when I told her I was going to Russia. There are 10 former secret cities in Russia and our government is special, especially interested in three of them. One of which is our sister city. It's the city of Snezhensk. And it's a place where nuclear weapons were made um, during the Cold War. I am the first American mayor. It's my understanding that's gone into a closed city. It's extremely interesting. If you took uh, the fences that surrounded Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory in San Diego and move them to our city boundaries, then you would have a sense of Snezhensk. The residents were considered the elite during the Soviet Union. They were the, the brain of Russia. They designed uh, bombs, made bombs. They're uh, highly educated scientists and engineers. The United States interest stems from an interest in seeing that the scientists don't go to other countries, uh, don't sell their secrets or plutonium to other countries that we consider unfriendly, China, North Korea, Iraq, Iran. If we become friends, and our children become friends, then we're not going to be pointing bombs at each other, because you don't point bombs at your friends. The centennial year was 1969, and there were a number of community uh, organizations that felt that there should be a time capsule buried to, to uh, establish the history at that time for future generations. So they collected enough things to completely fill a small canister. Uh, collected them at the city council chambers and we had an event there in uh, April of uh, 74 called the sealing ceremony when we uh, toasted it with some bottles of wine and then chose one bottle from King Cannons and one bottle from Wente's to put in the time capsule. The Public Works Department uh, 
and I was the director of public works at that time, was responsible for burying it. The capsule was buried at a time where it was not supposed to be too publicly known. And that was uh, in the, late in the evening. And the time capsule had been donated by Dom Surplus. It was an old surplus container, uh, I believe aluminum. And uh, then turned it over to Dan Lee, the public works department, to be buried. Well, his idea was that it should be buried in private so that no one would, would dig it up right away and that it would be uh, better not to have it marked. And that was a mistake. We didn't really want everybody to know where, exactly where it was buried and uh, so that somebody wouldn't dig it up at a later date, some dark night, and, uh, and make off with the time capsule. It was sometime at the beginning of this year that Barry Schrader, representing Sandia National Laboratories, came to me and he wanted to unbury that time capsule. Well, I didn't have a problem with that. So I put him in touch with the director of public service and said, you know, have at it. So my suggestion to the city council was accepted and they uh, asked Mike Miller, the public services director, to uh, send out a crew uh, on a day that was compatible for all of us and the mayor too and try to dig up the uh, capsule. Uh, my boss just said, uh, you two guys are going to go out. We're going to try and find this time capsule. He kind of briefed us on it and told us what it was about and where it was buried, well, general area. Oh, well, it can be the size of a propane tank. Oh, well, actually, it's uh, you know, about this big. Well, you know, it's long and it's short. It's... So everybody had a different idea of what it looked like. So we really weren't sure the whole time we were looking for it. We just knew it was metal. They, had, they called out the Livermore Historical Society. They called out all these news agencies. They had the director of public works. They had the director of our department. They had a couple, you know, head guys there, a lot of spectators. There was some pressure, <laughs> needless to say. The mayor. The mayor. And the next thing I knew, he called in a date for me to, to be there when they dug up this time capsule. I mean, we dug and we dug and we dug and we dug, and then we had little metal detectors, and we kept picking up, you know, bottle caps and other kinds of metal items out there in the park. There was a lot of news reporters that first day. Fox National News, a couple of local news, a lot of papers. I was pretty surprised how many news agencies were there. I thought it was fun. I, mean, I absolutely thought it was fun. It was like a scavenger hunt. But it became pretty serious business. Usually when I sell a metal detector to somebody, the first thing they want to do is run to a ghost town. Uh, the ghost towns have been hunted out. They're historical land landmarks, most of them. You can't use a metal detector in a lot of them. Some you still can, but they've been hunted out. They've been really worked over very hard. This town was around in the same era and a lot of other towns that people still live in. And people don't think of that because it's where they live. They just don't realize it's not what's here now. It, what was on this land a hundred years ago? Um, like I say, I have found coins from the 1800s right here in town, uh, between stores, land. If you can find where they pull the blacktop or cement 
get in there with your metal detector if they'll give you permission. Uh, always try to find permission, get permission to go in on private property. Uh, you'd be surprised what you might find. You might even find in your own yard. Uh, I've had several people very surprised at what they found. I walked out the front door one day uh, as I was opening the store and I looked down and I saw the uh, local free newspaper that they hand out here and I saw the mayor on the cover with a cheap metal detector I felt couldn't find a cannonball on top of the ground. I thought she really needed some help. There were uh, a few people around probing into the ground to see if they could find it. Uh, I really didn't see a lot. Uh, they left. I kept on with the metal detector. We had a representative from a that sells metal detectors. He was out there with his, you know, trying to find it. I'm watching him do his work, and I look over, and the bus pulls up, and another guy gets off the bus with a metal detector. I'm just going, oh man. What he had, I didn't think would do it. Uh, it was, it was one of the the cheaper end White's metal detectors. It didn't go nearly as deep as the one I brought out there. The one I brought out would, went 20 feet deep. What he brought out there went about eight inches. And so I, I didn't think that he was going to find it then. Obviously, he didn't. The machine that I brought out was a TM-808 from White's Electronics. And it's designed to go very deep into the ground and pick up large objects, such as treasure chests, storage containers, um, um, anything, any large objects that's buried into the ground, they, they usually use those for treasure hunting and that sort of thing. They used various probes and metal detectors to try to find it, and even used a radar from the laboratory to, in order to locate it. And I was, I was really shocked that they didn't find it with that, because they do find quite a few things with that, dinosaur bones, um, things of that nature, treasure chests and stuff. They recover quite a few things with that. The guy with the metal detector from the company, he was searching, I mean, all over, over near the sign, over near the benches. So I, I continued to search for it, and I looked for it for, a, oh, approximately a week, or if not two. I wanted to be the one to, to, to uncover it. I was on the council when it was put in the ground, but I wasn't there when it was put in the ground. So none of us knew exactly where it was. But of course I said to other people, surely there has to be a record at City Hall. And I don't think it was uh, a comedy of errors at all that they couldn't find it. I was tired of getting phone calls day and night, tired of going out there when somebody else had an idea where they thought it might be, so they, asked, they would call me up and ask me to come out with them and, and go through the business of the metal detectors particularly. And also, uh, the press, of course, was calling us every few days saying, have you found it yet? You know, are you giving up? What are you going to do next? My understanding was that Barry knew where this time capsule I think Barry knew sort of where it was at, but not really. And then I heard he even brought in one of the Livermore police dogs, and I heard a lot of weird stories. People were making fun of us, and people were driving by, honking their horns and, and uh, yelling at us. And, and it also became sort of an object of uh, ridicule in the newspapers. You know, Livermore, with all of its high-tech equipment, they didn't even know where it was. Well, they knew where it was, but they didn't know precisely exactly where it was. How could they lose the canister? Like someone said, here's a small city, there are more PhDs there, supposedly, than any place in the United States, and they can't even keep track of a canister. <laughs> I barely, I don't need hardly, as a matter of fact, I don't think I was even there when the time capsule was buried. Maybe I was, you know, I had seven photographic assignments a day. I showed up, somebody did something, took a picture, went back, processed, and it was in the newspaper. I don't recall the time capsule at all. All I can remember is that uh, my
placed in the time capsule, and I thought I would never see that again in my lifetime. I was not able to give them a great deal of help with the locating of it because I had forgotten where it was, was actually located. I had heard that it was buried behind the totem pole somewhere, and I had heard that several years ago. All of us who were around, or still around from 1974 when they buried it, knew it was at the totem pole, but most of us didn't have the faintest idea where near the totem pole it was. I did get a tone in the ground uh, where I thought it might be, but there was also this big metal I-beam running down the backside of, the, of a totem pole into the ground, and when I would get near it, the machines would, would sound off because of the metal there. Time capsule and totem pole curse. When you have a sense of anger and outrage, along with putting a curse you actually make powerful medicine. Sometimes you don't know the consequences of that action. If Livermore is still here 100 years from now, and it's whether it's part of the United States or another country or, or taken over by another uh, uh, force, um, I think they'll still dig up the time capsule and still enjoy the contents. Hopefully it'll still be here. It, it won't be leveled or there won't be a, a giant uh, uh, building over the top of it so they can't find it. Cover the vineyards over, build elegant abodes, strip away the meadows, construct a web of roads. A hundred years has only changed the surface of the land. Our proud centennial lady still is beautiful, so beautiful and grand. Mm -hmm. I don't like the last two lines, but it is a nice, it is a nice song. Thank you. 